Good morning, everyone. I hope you have enjoyed this year's ACCA conference and enjoyed your time in Mobile. <clears throat> we have had beautiful weather uh, in Mobile this week, and we couldn't have asked for a more perfect conference uh, weather-wise and uh, facility-wise that the folks here at the Renaissance and the Convention Center have been very helpful throughout this whole process. One thing I forgot to announce yesterday, and I do apologize, is I forgot to thank a couple of people uh, while everyone was in here. Um, Wes Terrain and the Calhoun crew do the, uh, an awesome job with our audiovisual. Wes, will y'all please be recognized over there? <clears throat> And when we decided to come to Mobile, Dr. Sykes was all on board. Uh, he has been very instrumental in getting the Austell tour lined up. And so, Dr. Sykes, for you and your, the folks at your college, if you don't realize, Bishop State provided not only ambassadors, they provided a cosmetology department, they also provided uh, nursing students with blood pressure checks and all that. So, Bishop, Thank you very much, but we also want to say thank you to the Coastal Alabama uh, ambassadors as well for their help with guiding uh, participants around. So let's give them applause. <clears throat> At this time, I would like to introduce our platform guest. To my immediate right is Mr. Jimmy Baker, Chancellor of the Alabama Community College System. To his right is Dr. Reginald Sykes, President of Bishop State Community College. To my left is Dr. Mark Milliron, our keynote speaker, and he will be introduced a little bit more, uh, a little bit later. Uh, next to Dr. Milliron is Dr. Victoria Perry, ACCA First Vice President, President-Elect, and Counselor within the Division of Student Development Services at Bishop State Community College. And to her left is Mr. Ben Jordan, ACCA Second Vice President and Vice President of Financial and Administrative Services at Southern Union State Community College. Help welcome the platform guests, please. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sykes to bring uh, uh, some brief comments. And then after Dr. Sykes speaks, uh, Mr. Ben Jordan will introduce our keynote. Good morning. I see some of you all are dragging in this morning. The rumor is that some of you danced the night away. I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for coming to Mobile for, the, for this conference. And I know for, for some of you, it was a, it was a long drive to, to get here. But the sessions have been great. Hopefully, you have met new friends. Hopefully, the, you have enjoyed the Gulf Coast food, and you've had fun. That's important that you also, you also had an opportunity to have fun. It's my understanding that it has been nine years um, since the conference, ACC conference, has been held in Mobile. So I hope that it would not be another nine years before ACCA decides to come back to Mobile. So I just, want to, I just want to say thank you again for coming to Mobile, safe travels home, and a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Dr. Mark Milliron is an award-winning leader, author, speaker, and consultant who works with universities, community colleges, K-12 schools, foundations, corporations, associations, and government agencies across the country and around the world. He is co-founder and chief learning officer of Civitas Learning, a social purpose corporation committed to using the best of data science and data thinking to help students learn well and finish strong on educational pathways. He also serves as executive director of Civitas Learning's Next Generation Leadership Academy, a program designed to prepare rising leaders to guide innovation and transformation in education. Mark serves on the boards and advisory councils of leading educational organizations, including the Trellis Foundation, the Global Online Academy, and the Mastery Transcript Consortium. 
In previous roles, Mark served as Deputy, Deputy Director for Post-Secondary Success with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Founding Chancellor of Western Governors University, Texas, Endowed Fellow and Director of the National Institute of Staff and Organizational Development at the University of Texas, Austin, Vice President for Education and Medical Practice with SAS, and President and CEO of the League for Innovation in the Community College. Past board service includes the American Council of Education, Western Governors University, and the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. In 1999, the University of Texas at Austin's College of Education named Mark a distinguished graduate for his service in the education field. In 2007, the American Association of Community Colleges presented him with its National Leadership Award. In 2013, he was inducted into the United States Distance Learning Association's Hall of Fame. In, in 2016, he was chosen by the Chronicle of Higher Education as one of the top technology innovators in higher education. And in 2018, Mark was listed by EdTech Digest as one of the top influencers of education technology. Regardless of all his activities, and accomplishments, Mark will quickly tell you that the, his most important job and the greatest blessing in his life is serving as Julia's husband and his father to Alexandria, Richard, Marcus, and Max. Please help me welcome Dr. Mark Millarn. So, um, Ben did not let you know that I was president of my eighth grade class. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as with yesterday, when I was talking with uh, <clears throat> the administrative group, I, was, um, I made the case that whenever I talk to community college audiences, I always begin by saying thank you, um, because I'm kind of your fault. Uh, I would not be here if it wasn't for a community college. I come from a family of nine kids. I have an African American brother, Native American brother, and a Korean sister. Um, in addition to that, we had 25 foster kids who rotated through my house during the time I was growing up. My mom specialized in um, newborns with special needs, and my dad was out of his mind. <laughs> so a big, rowdy household. And I was the first one in my family to go on a higher education journey. And if it wasn't for, and we had no knowing about what, was, what higher education was all about. Um, and my mom and dad loved me to death, but they were worried about what our choices would be. And I, and I literally... My mom would not sign my counseling cards to allow me to take college prep courses when I was in high school. So um, because it was a big enough family, I was able to just hide and get them and, and forge them. <laughs> and I was able to take those courses. And uh, I was the first one to go on the higher journey. What was fascinating is, is um, thankfully, Mesa Community College was right there and helped me get on the pathway to possibility. But I can name the faculty members and staff members that absolutely changed my life and kind of redirected where I was going. But when I started at Mesa Community College, I kid you not, I did not know what an AA was. I didn't know what an AS was. I kind of knew what BS was, right? <laughs> I was figuring it out as I went along. And, and, and that first generation journey has always stuck with me. And it's one of the reasons why I have been dedicated to kind of opening the pathway to possibility through, uh, for education for a long time. So let's talk about, um, if you can pop the slides up, let's talk about the conversation today around tomorrow ready education. I, this conversation means a lot because I think sometimes we get so wrapped in the negativity of the world that's around us, we don't think that things are possible. And what I, what I want to propose to you today is as, as leaders within this system, there is a moment. We have a moment right now to absolutely change the trajectories in higher education for um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of students nationally and internationally. But it means we're going to have to be willing to believe it's possible and then do some of the work. And, um, in setting up the conversation about believing it's possible, I'm going to encourage you to read, there's a powerful book that came out in the last year called Enlightenment Now. And in this book, um, Steven Pinker makes the case uh, that there are people out there who feel like we have not made progress in big things. And if you actually understand how systems work, he talks about the law of, second law of thermodynamics. And the second law of thermodynamics basically says in closed systems, things fall apart. Things do fall apart. Um, it's, the law, it's basically the law of entropy. The thing, the thing is, is even with that law at play, human beings on this earth have made unbelievable progress in certain areas. In fact, if you look at the data um, around life expectancy, hunger, child mortality, global health, um, in the last 
500 years, but especially, especially post-enlightenment, it's been unbelievable. The challenge is people think, some people think, one, it's not possible, or two, they think it's just natural. We're gonna go up and to the right. Neither of those are true. It actually takes focused leadership and people who really care about things to change the dynamic. I mean, just think about things like life expectancy. How many people in here are over the age of 40? Okay, 100 years ago, you'd all be dead. And what I mean by that is life expectancy was around 40, okay? And that was just the change in it. I mean, think about um, hunger. Malthus made the argument, it's why the term Malthusian is what it is. Malthus made the argument about 400 years ago that the earth would never be able to support more than a billion people. He said there was no way we'd be able to support over a billion people. And he said that because of disease and the fact that we'd never have a food supply to be able to support more than a billion people. Anybody know how many people are on the earth right now? It's over seven billion people. I mean, when you're seven times wrong, I mean, that is majorly wrong, right? In terms of the direction of it. Um, and just to make an even clearer case around this, these are data around um, global poverty. Um, and what these data show, and you can't read this really clearly, but this is the share of the world population living in absolute poverty. And they define absolute poverty as two standards. One is basically living on the equivalent of $2 a day, and the other is the equivalent of $1 a day, which means your entire life infrastructure costs about $1 a day to be able to live um, and, and, and right now, extreme poverty is brutal, but nowhere near what it was 200 years ago. And listen to me on this. 200 years ago, 90% of the world lived in extreme poverty. History was written by the rich 10%, right? 90% of the world. In the last 200 years, we have totally changed that dynamic. And just in the last 30 years, we have made this shift since the global development goals. We were down to about 30%, 36% of the world living in extreme poverty, and now we're into the single digits. And that's happened because of the, the global development goals where people have said, we're gonna get our arms around this and we're gonna change this dynamic. It was major, major work. The challenge around this, and one of the things that, the, that um, Pincus points out in his book, is this notion, and I'll leave a couple of the power quotes, whether or not the world is really getting worse, the nature of news will interact with the nature of cognition to make us think it is. And there's something called the availability heuristic, which means stuff that's all around us all the time. People estimate the probability of an event or a frequency of a kind of thing by the ease with which instances come to mind. Our problem is with cable news networks and the internet, all the bad stuff in the earth can come to us right away, right? We get it around us all the time. And the challenge is because of that, we think things are always falling apart. And the truth is, I mean, things like, you know, even like our violent crime statistics in the United States are at an all time low, but people think it's the least safe it's ever been, right? And why I'm saying, kind of making this case is the idea that there is hope, but we have to really kind of break out of these assumptions around this. And I love, this is my favorite quote from the book, which says, nothing is more responsible for the feelings of the good old days than a bad memory, right? It's the idea that we have made unbelievable progress, but it took effort. It took leaders kind of driving this larger process. Our challenge right now is in the world of education, we're surrounded by bad news. People are pounding down on education for its failures, for its challenges, whatever it is. We see headline after headline. Higher education is failing students. 18 systems, the US education system is failing. Why community colleges are failing underserved youth. Everybody's pounding down on education. Do you feel beaten up a little bit? Okay. And here's the challenge. If you look back 150 years ago, America has been an amazing story of transformation and educational opportunity. We have gone from 15% literacy to over 90% literacy in this country. It's been an unbelievable shift in how we've rolled out public education systems and technical colleges, community colleges. We've done unbelievable work to drive access. The challenge now is we're trying to go to the next level and think about how we not just, uh, our real innovation of the last 150 years, and hold on to this, you should feel good about this. Our innovation of the last 150 years has been innovation around access. We have moved from an aristocracy of education to a meritocracy, and now we're moving to a democracy of education where anybody who wants to can have access to an educational pathway if they're willing to do the work, but access in it isn't enough. In the late 2000s, we started this move towards completion where we said it's not enough to get them in, we gotta help them get across the stage. And so our challenges now in the world of education are a, a host of things where we're saying access is great, we wanna keep access going, but we wanna have broader success. 
We want to see more students finish what they start. We want them to finish on time. We want them to finish in degrees that have all kinds of economic potential, like STEM credentials. We want to close equity gaps in our completion, uh, completion areas. We also want to make sure that we're focusing on diversity and the personalization of the educational experience. And by the way, you can, you can raise completion very easily. Um, very easily, if you want to raise completion rates, all you have to do is close down access and only serve the best possible students, right? Easiest way to get a really successful hospital is to only serve healthy patients, right? If you want to change that dynamic, you have to be willing to open up to a broader set of population. This is about more students who are more diverse being more successful than ever before, but that means we have to wrap our arms around these challenges at a time when resources aren't going up. Okay, and we're having to figure out how we, we transform an educational infrastructure in a way that's going to mean something different for the, for the players that we're working with. And in this context, I'm going to tell you, we can come through to the other side of this, but it's going to take leaders like you driving this work. And it means, I'm going to argue three big conversations, and I call these conversation pairs. They're conversations around quality in the learning mix. We're about to have a continued transformation of our learning infrastructure with more ability to teach and learn um, at a high level than ever before, but we're gonna have to look at the pathways in a more concrete way, which means a conversation around data science and learning pathways, and it means that we are gonna have to be leaders on this process and, and ask hard questions as we're driving this work. And, and I'm gonna walk you through each of these kind of conversations, and I'm gonna encourage you in your own context to take these conversations back and begin to stir the pot and to see whether or not people are willing to have these conversations. And I gotta tell you, if, as you have these conversations, buckle up, because as you have these conversations, two groups come out loud and proud. One group are the caustic cynics. Caustic cynics are angry about everything. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. You bring manna from heaven, it's too salty for them, and they're angry, right? Okay. A friend of mine calls them the cave people, colleagues against virtually everything, right? How many of you know a cave person in your world? If you can't think of the cave person, you might be. <laughs> I'll point that out. They're only equaled by the true believers. The true believers will overpromise and underdeliver, and they'll cut the credibility out of your initiatives. What you really want is that, that workspace in the middle, which is where the thoughtful critics and the careful advocates can drive this larger work. And, and by the way, I'm going to give you all the PowerPoint presentation. If you want it, I'm John Negley, go ahead and raise your hand in the front row. If you want to give him a card afterwards, we'll get you the PowerPoint presentation. It's going to have links out to all the different articles and the research pieces I'm talking about. The, the idea is for you to be able to take this and kind of drive it home. I'm also very careful about PowerPoint. I talked about yesterday, students, have, uh, students in the focus groups have taught me that many people who use PowerPoint have no power nor a point. <laughs> One student had a great line that said, PowerPoint corrupts. Okay, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's a whole idea of us making sure we're using our tools the right way. But let's talk about the learning mix for a second. I wrote a piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education a few years ago called Time to End the Family Feud, where I basically made the argument that it's time for us to get beyond the argument about what's better, online education or traditional education. The world is blending, whether we like it or not. They're mixing and matching all of these tool suites. We are driving doctors crazy. We go to WebMD and fully self-diagnose and come in with printouts to our doctor's visits, right? We have this full blended experience, and part of our conversation right now is driving some of this transformation, but realize this is not an easy process in education. I began my career in the 1990s, early 1990s, I kid you not, I was brought in to college after college after college to try to convince educators that it was going to be okay to use email. <laughs> kid you not. And I was talking to folks yesterday about the fact that there were presidents in this country who were fired because they took the cubbies away. Right? And had people move to use of email. And then it was the rise of the internet in the mid-90s trying to convince people that the internet was a thing. It wasn't a fad. Right? We really were going to use this. And then it was the rise of other kinds of tools like mobile devices. Ten years ago, people started saying, get ready, we're going to all have mobile devices where we're going to have access to things like everything from uh, ease of shopping to GPS systems. And I remember being at an educational conference, I kid you not, a president of the League for Innovation, we brought in somebody from MIT talking about the coming GPS systems. And we're going to have GPS systems in our cars. They're going to give it, you put in the address, it'll give you a visual map, it'll tell you to turn left, tell you to turn right. And everybody was like, Ooh, ah, oh, and wowing. And afterwards, the evaluations on the conference uh, forums, I kid you not, said this was an incredible speaker, so visionary, but for the love of God, don't bring somebody so impractical to our conference. This is never going to happen in my lifetime. How many of you used a GPS system in the last day, right? <laughs> okay. 
Okay? These infrastructures come, right? And they come over time. And, and the mobile infrastructure in particular, if you look at the Pew data, the Pew data shows us that 75% of our students are using smartphones, not just cell phones, smartphones, digitally connected devices. I was in South Africa um, a week and a half ago, and in, in the most distressed communities, I uh, couldn't believe the penetration of smartphones, and it was because it was their access to work, it was their access to life, it was part of the infrastructure of the work that, the work that they have. Um, the students are saying 58% of them are having to use their smartphones to take pictures of slides in their classrooms, right? And then 39% are using them to access digital textbooks, which I think is fascinating. You realize only 55% of the students are actually buying the textbooks for your classes because they're accessing using digital resources. So we've got a blended online and online on ground and mobile infrastructure. And the next phase of it's coming at us, folks. Um, the next phase of this is us have actually asking an, um, hard questions about what we're going to do next. And I got to tell you, virtual reality and augmented reality is coming. And if you as educators, uh, this will link you out to a couple of great demo presentations, but you have to see what this is like. When you can teach anatomy physiology and have somebody go into a place where a floating heart is in front of them and they can take apart the heart and understand the pieces and parts of it, or you're teaching auto mechanics and there's a floating engine and they can go with haptic gloves and take the engine apart and have all the pieces and parts come together, you realize this is gonna be a little bit different. And then you're gonna have things like augmented reality and augmented reality is here. I mean, people are already building it into advertising. I'm gonna show you a quick video on the augmented reality side. And this is where you actually can walk up to things with your phone or your iPad or other resources and actually have information pop out. The idea is we now have more tools at our disposal to teach at a higher level than ever before, but to do this work right, we have to be very careful because the challenge of this work is that people sometimes go over the edge and they actually take it to the extreme and think that the technology will fix everything. And part of it's because we live in this world where especially our young people are engaged at a really deep level. How many of you have a young person in your world that plays video games? Or maybe you're, you are that person who plays video games, right? How much time and effort will they put in to go from one level of a game to the next level of a game? Yeah, they're for, for go food, sleep, all the rest, the Fortnite addiction, whatever it is, they have to go through therapy. Uh, but what's fascinating is anybody who says kids can't concentrate has not watched this behavior, right? And think about it for a second. The game designers have stolen from learning theory. They have absolutely stolen from learning theory. I've been in the meetings where I've talked about this. It's part of what they've learned. And think about how the games are designed. Most of the games are designed where the gamers have to go into an environment, they have to develop knowledge, skills, and ability at one level and have it assessed before they're allowed to go to the next level. What does that sound like? <laughs> kind of sounds like education, right? And why there is so much energy around gaming and learning is because of how much they've connected in this. One of the things they've learned about games, by the way, and listen to how this, is they've, they've stolen this from the zone of proximal development in the world of education. They call it in the game world the zone of proximal engagement, which means the game designers have figured out if you make the game too easy, gamers don't like it and they quit. If you make the game too hard, gamers don't like it and they quit. If you make it just hard enough, they will be addicted to it forever, right? 
They lean into it like crazy. And by the way, we've learned this in the world of education. They've also learned the, the value of feedback. If you don't give a gamer feedback that tells them they're on track or off track, on at least, on, I mean, in Microsoft Xbox calls it the minute rule. Every minute there's some kind of hat tip or score thing that shows a, shows a gamer they're on track or off track. There's a ton for us to think about in terms of this game design. And by the way, if you want to read more about this, Jane McGonigal is one of the most thoughtful writers around this. She has a great book called Reality is Broken, which is kind of her seminal book on this topic. Her more recent one is called Super Better, which is about actually bringing gaming principles into the mental health issues. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons she's done this is the mental health crisis in higher education, especially with a lot of young people. But what we've learned is that, and by the way, this is... For those of you who think gaming in education is new, I just want you to take a deep breath on this and, and kind of take a step back. Games in education have been around for thousands of years. These are just digital tools that bring games to education. Are you with me on this? This is the power of contextual and simulation-based education. This is where apprenticeships began. This is the idea of people putting learning into practice. This is experiential learning at a high level. We are gonna have an infrastructure for learning at a high level that's gonna be face-to-face -face and, on, and online and mobile with AR and VR. And by the way, I've done the student focus groups. The students basically say, we don't want it all tech-enabled. We want it blended. We want some online, some on ground. We actually want to have this blend. That means the blend has to be tuned. So if you look at the slide, you're going to see some of the big research initiatives around this where people are saying, how do we put this together in a thoughtful way? This is going to be one of your charges in the next three, five, ten years, is how do you blend these, this infrastructure? And I want to make sure we're clear about this. We have to stop talking about facilities over here and technology over here. We have to start talking about a blended infrastructure for learning. In fact, a lot of our boards have, have committees that are just for technology or committees that are just for technology uh, or facilities and technology. We've got to blend those into an infrastructure conversation and figure out how we're going to power new models like competency-based education, like accelerated developmental education. Um, in fact, the folks at SCUP who really champion the notion of integrated modeling, and this will take you out to an article from them, they say we should stop talking about online learning altogether and we should, <laughs> their phrase, I'm not sure is going to catch on, their phrase is ubiquitous integrated learning. I don't think that's catching on anytime soon. But I get what they're saying. It's the idea that, that we have learning on all the time and it's around us all the time. And the idea is for us to figure out how we're going to make that work. It also means that we as leaders are going to have to be willing to ask the hard questions about what's working and what's not, and how we can build resources for greater access, and also how we deal with affordability. So this will link you out to the, the work of Candace Thiel at Stanford, who her center is called the Open Learning Center, where they're using human learning science to tune the blend. What's the best thing to do face-to-face, -face, the best thing to do online, the best thing to do with digital? And the idea is to figure out how we can be a learning scientists and actually figure out how we help somebody learn something in a deeper and richer way, which, by the way, all great teachers do. All great faculty members get their heads around all the tools at their disposal and figure out how they can inspire learning. But it means students are going to do some things online, some things on ground. And let me tell you what, it also means we're going to have to power different models of delivery. When you've got working students who have to work while they're going to school, it means we have to think about things like eight-week courses as opposed to 16-week courses that are, that are coupled with online to actually blend the experience for them. Because I've talked to the students, taking five courses at the same time while you're working 40 hours and taking, and taking care of two kids, is that an easy thing? No. Students, I mean, students actually have complicated lives, and if they can take two courses at a time, they can get their mind around that. And if you do two courses in eight weeks, two courses in eight weeks, you've done four courses in 16 weeks, right? The folks at Odessa College have done this, and they've taken their graduation rate from 13% to 38% in three years by making this shift, okay? But it means you have to get the tech infrastructure around this to be able to make this work and ask the questions, especially around effectiveness, but also affordability. And I want to talk about affordability for a second, because if you look at the movement around open education resources, how many of you are experimenting with OER and OER resources? Okay, I'm going to encourage you, homework, to look into open education resources. There are hundreds of colleges around the country that are, in fact, thousands, if you're talking about the four-year space as well, who are now investing in open education resources to complement what the publishers are doing. Part of the reason they're doing it has to do with cost. Are students upset about textbook costs at all? Anybody? Yeah. Um, the OER folks have now developed curricular resources for almost every major course that's out there at a high level. If you go to OER Commons, for example, I'll link you out. OERcommons.org has figured something out about great teachers. 
Great teachers love, and they call it the case method. Great teachers love the case method. Case stands for copy and steal everything, right? Somebody else does it well, you're gonna bring that resource into your environment. And they've created these open education resource environments where you take whatever the course is, here are the learning outcomes, they will curate digital curricular resources that are free, okay? Whether they're text, they're PowerPoints, they're media, that will allow students to access that resource. You think students like this? Yeah, we've actually developed a scheduling tool that allows students to pick their courses based on which courses offer OER. Guess which ones they choose at a three, one, three to one rate? Because the OER, again, the whole idea is to focus on the quality and keep it up. But it means we've gotta be willing to have this conversation. Like I said, I was in, I was in South Africa last week. Go ahead and go to the slides again. Um, and I was meeting with a group of students who were telling me their stories and I was absolutely blown away. But one of the stories that really hit me was, I mean, these were all graduate students at Vitz University. Vitz University, since apartheid, has completely transformed itself. So it's gone from 30% um, black to 70% black, 50% first generation students, and it's still the top university in the country. And one of the things these students were telling us was just about their unbelievable pathways into this environment. But one group of students, one student in particular, um, Seshi in the middle in the striped shirt, told the story, he came from a, a rural area, farm community, they had no real school. They had a one-room schoolhouse with a teacher who kind of knew some stuff, and they brought seven kids from the different farms, to, and they taught, learned together over the course of 10 years. They got to about basically our sophomore year in high school, and the teacher was done. She didn't know anything else. They had two more years to be able to get through before they could write what's called their matriculation exams, which allows them to get into higher ed. And they knew they had math and science they had to learn, and they were just, they didn't know what to do. So they got together and got on the internet and accessed open education resources, and they figured out the material, they, the expectations that were gonna be on the exam, and they created a curriculum for themselves with OER, and for two years, five of these students taught themselves physics and calculus and advanced math, and then got themselves to write the matriculation exams, okay? And all that, by the way, that all came because a group of educators 10 years ago came together and created a, an accord around open education resources that said what you learn should not be based on where you live, right? It should be based on your, everybody should have access to high quality content. And they were able to learn this at a high enough level where they scored in the top 2% for the entire country. That's amazing. Right? But that took focused leadership and focused effort from educators that came together, and 10 years ago, that didn't exist. He would not have had this resource if educators didn't come together and say, we're gonna change things and create a different kind of, of opportunity for students and, and a different kind of pathway. That means the kind of work we're gonna do around learning really matters, but it's not just around learning, it's also around the pathway. Because what the data show is we have real inequalities in the ability to navigate higher education. And I know you feel this every single day. When I was at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, people thought the Gates Foundation got into higher ed because they wanted to fix higher ed. Absolutely not. They got into higher ed because of poverty. Um, Warren Buffett gave a huge gift into the Gates Foundation and said, I want you to focus on poverty in the United States. They did a year-long study in 2007 under Hillary Pennington to analyze poverty dynamics in the US. And guess what they found out was the number one disintermediator of the cycle of poverty um, in the United States. The number one thing that broke cycles of poverty, which by the way, our cycles of poverty, our transmission of poverty across generations is now the highest it's ever been. You're more likely to die poor in the US if you were born poor right now at any time in our history, which does that break anybody else's heart? It change, we have to change that social mobility dynamic. But the single biggest disruptor of that cycle of poverty is what? It used to be K-12 education, you're right, but now, guess what it is? It is the achievement of, listen to this term, a post-secondary credential with labor market value. Notice I did not say a four-year degree. What I said was a post-secondary credential with labor market value. It's the family of credentials, including industry certifications, diplomas, associate's degrees, and bachelor's degrees and master's degrees. If, if, if a especially a low-income student between the ages of 16 and 26 achieves, achieves one of these credentials, it not only changes their lives, it changes who? It changes their kids and it changes their extended family. It's crazy how it ripples if you, if you do this right. And so why Gates got into this is the idea if we could change that dynamic, but here's the problem. If you break students in higher ed into income quartiles, the top income quartile, in other words, the richest kids in this country, are 85 to 95% likely to finish if they start a higher ed journey. The bottom income quartile, 
this is what breaks your heart, is 12 to 18% likely, okay? And that dynamic has got to shift if we're gonna do this better, which is why people say, we've gotta figure out this pathway issue. And part of it just has to do with the knowing. I mean, my four kids, again, are going to be second generation higher education students. And again, juxtapose my experience of walking onto Mesa Community College campus, and I had no clue what I was doing. I was, I was going through what I jokingly call post-traumatic jock syndrome. I played a lot of sports in high school, I had to figure out what I was gonna do, right? Juxtapose that with my kids, and I have four kids, which my mom calls a starter family. You look at that in a second. Every one of my kids had a UT Austin onesie on in the crib. They were prepared for higher education from birth, heavily scaffolded and ready to take on that journey, which means it was, they were going to be ready to manage the journey. I'm going to argue there's some redesign work for us as educators to think about how we do it. And I want, you to, I want to use an example. So the, the folks at the Cleveland Clinic did a big initiative in the late 2000s where they basically said, okay, we should, we should trust people with their data. We should get data in the hands of patients and allow them to help kind of guide their care. It was called the MyChart Initiative. And the whole idea was to turn chart data over to patients to allow them to help manage their disease states. Part of it was because we were driving them crazy by searching it for ourselves, and they said, let's just give them the information and see if they can be partners in this. And what they found is, especially people with chronic diseases like diabetes and Addison's disease and others, it, them having their charts made them better managers of their own health as opposed to having to go to the doc all the time. This led, by the way, what they found was this, led, this openness of the data changed the whole dynamic and created a whole set of conversations, which, by the way, led to this wonderful thing called Fitbit and the Apple Watches and all the things we have now. Uh, by the way, people are addicted to these data now around their fitness things. A friend of mine the other day was in a really bad mood, and I'm like, Bob, what is going on with you? He's like, oh, my Fitbit ran out of power last night. I didn't get my sleep data. I'm like, what? <laughs> You're that upset about that? I wanted my REM and my deep sleep and all this. I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> but people are, are connected to this in a really big way. But this has to do with designing the data in a way and actually under designing how we're serving people. And, and the example I love is the example around the MRI. Um, how many of you can relate to the MRI, have been a part of an MRI experience? Thank you, we're my empathizers out there. Okay, you're gonna get this. Um, about two years ago, I uh, got another tear in my right shoulder. I had a couple tears because of a motorcycle accident and something else, but this one was serious enough where I had to go into a doc. And the doc said, oh yeah, you've got two, maybe, I think you have at least two or three maybe major tears in your shoulder, might need surgery. So he said, we're gonna send you in to get an MRI. And I've never had an MRI before. I mean, I'd watch the show House, so I can see MRIs all the time. Like, okay, let's go do the MRI. So I go down to ARA, which is a center for uh, radiolog radiology in Austin, and I go in, and I'm on a table very much like this, and, and I get in, take off all my clothes, put on my, my thing, lay back on the thing. And the guy immediately goes, okay, he goes, a couple questions first before we do this. He goes, you're not claustrophobic, are you? I said, I don't think I'm claustrophobic. I've literally have gone into lava caves two miles under the earth on my belly scooting into two. So I've, I don't think I'm claustrophobic. But I'm like, no, I don't think I'm claustrophobic. He goes, good, because a lot of wimps have a problem with this thing. Here's this little button. If you have any kind of problem, go ahead and push it. But I'd recommend you not push it because we have to start over from the beginning. I'm like, oh, great. We're going to start with shaming. That's not how we're going to make this work, right? I'm like, okay, and he goes, um, and so I lay back on it, and he goes, I'm gonna lock your shoulder in here, because the shoulder especially can't move, and then you're gonna go into the tube, and we start going back towards the hole. And, and, and I look back at the hole, and then I look at him, and we both look at the hole. As I'm going back into the hole, we both realize, I'm not gonna fit in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 6'4", 250, I am not gonna fit easily in that hole. And the guy goes, yeah, you might have to scooch your other shoulder over. I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, scooch your other shoulder, scooch. And he goes, he had to kind of grab my shoulder and scooches my shoulder, my shoulder gets scooched. And I'm in the tube, and it just keeps going into the tube. And I'm thinking to myself, I mean, then I'm this far away from the top, and there's a little blue line right here, and I'm being scooched into the tube, and I'm thinking it's my shoulder, okay, it's maybe going to go up to here. No, 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 no. They go all the way up to my ankles in the machine. I mean, I'm like toothpaste going back in the toothpaste tube, right? <laughs> And I'm sitting there in this tube going, this cannot be right, and my heart is going crazy kind of a thing. And the guy goes, oh, don't worry about it. He goes, this procedure only takes like 35 minutes. I'm like, what? 35 minutes? What are you talking about? He goes, oh, and you might hear some clicking and popping. 
I'm like, oh, okay. And so I'm literally, I can feel my heart bursting out of my chest. And I'm like, okay, I fought competitive martial arts for years and I know meditation techniques. I calm myself down. I can go to my happy place. I'm mellowing out. And then the clicking and popping starts. And if you haven't been in an MRI, this is what the clicking and popping sounds like. Ah! Go, 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 go. Ah! I mean, that for the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, ah, 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 in all directions. I'm like, this cannot be normal. And so I'm in my head going, okay, other people have done this. I can do this. Other people have done this. I can do this. I'm just trying to get through it. And I'm thinking I'm being pretty heroic. And I'm thinking it's almost done. And the guy gets on the speaker and he's like, okay, you're five minutes in. And I'm like, oh no, five minutes. <laughs> and then finally I hear this, and I hear the, ooh, I start going, slowest birthing process ever. Like, and I'm, come out of it and I'm like bursting out. I think I ran naked to my car, I don't know, but I got out of there. <laughs> but I got in my car and I called a buddy of mine who's a doc and I'm like, what is going, Dan, what is going on with the MRI? And he goes, Mark, you have no idea how common the experience you just had was. He goes, in fact, he goes, there's a whole redesign effort around the MRI going on right now. And he sent me an article around this and one of the things he said was, when they started looking at the data, here's what they realized. The MRI was designed by researchers and doctors with incredibly good intentions. They wanted to get pictures that would save people's lives, that would absolutely make their lives better, but they had to get the right kind of pictures to be able to make them work. And so they did what they knew how to do to design this to be able to get the pictures they wanted. They never took the patient experience into account. Again, and they weren't bad people. They were really good people trying to get the right information to do good sting for patients, but they never took the patient experience in. When they started doing the analysis of the patient experience, what they found out was, man, over half of MRIs fail because people can't stay in the tube. And you've got to pay for an anesthesiologist. And when you have to get knocked out for an MRI, they don't knock you out completely. They've got to bring in an anesthesiologist and just bring you down. They have to give you enough to make you like you're drunk. Right? And then they voice control you while you're, while they're, it's basically like a little counseling session. Okay, don't wiggle, right, you know, while you're in there. I go, and then it's way worse with kids because they have like a 70% failure rate and a significant portion of kids have to go to counseling for claustrophobia trauma. Okay? So they're realizing this experience, while well-designed, highly educated people who wanted to get the right things to help people, the patient experience wasn't taken into account. Are you getting the analogy here at all? Um, what we know is in higher education, only about 55% of the people who start finish, okay? And we have all kinds of opportunities to think about the pathway. I'm gonna argue, based on the data that's been done, by the way, they redesigned the MRI, and this is what the new MRI looks like. One of the things they did is they sat down with IDEO, which is a design thinking firm, and said, let's take the patient experience into account, and they did it for kids first. In the first version of this, what they did in the redesign is they created the pirate ship. They also have the Buzz Lightyear. It's a more open MRI. They have a, they have a um, artificial reality helmet the kid goes into. They basically go on a pirate ship experience while they're sitting in there. They have a single digit failure rate. And no claustrophobia counseling. Some pirate counseling, but no claustrophobia counseling. <laughs> Their biggest problem with this is this is only for kids. And the adults walk by the pirate MRI, and their first reaction is, I want to be a pirate. <laughs> they want to go into the tube. <laughs> kind of a thing. What's interesting thing about this, and to go back to the slides if you can, is this is part of our conversation, is to figure out how we can design these pathways. And this is why using data together with our design minds, people have really been thinking about how we can take this amazing, powerful learning infrastructure together with the pathway the students are going to be on and help them not only learn well, but listen to me, learn well is great, but they have to be able to learn well and finish strong. If they don't finish strong, you're not helping them. Are you with me on this? They got, you got to think about their finishing strategy. And I'm going to tell you the three big things we've learned in the last five to seven years of doing this work is you got to think about an intelligence platform to help you understand what's working and what's not. You got to use that to inform the pathways and you got to use it to do more precision engagement. I'm going to give you some examples of this and I want to make sure you're clear about this. This is not about Civitas. This is about, I don't care what tool you use to make this work. These are three things you have to do to be able to make this pathway design kind of work. But the first one is to realize we spent the 80s and 90s developing these systems of record, these ERP systems that we use, student information systems. That was the big technology rollout. You remember Y2K where everybody had to get an ERP system, we did it? 
Then we had the rollout of learning management systems, which became a really big thing, and that was the systems of engagement along with mobile devices and the rest. I'm gonna argue the next phase of this level is the ability to roll out a student intelligence system, which is where you harvest data from engagement data and from the information system around students. Folks, I gotta tell you, one of the most important reasons to use an LMS, and stay with me on this, one of the most important reasons to use an LMS is not to power online learning. In fact, the biggest use of an LMS is to, to create a scaffold for on-ground learning. But one of the most important things is you actually get a data stream out of the LMS that tells you what's happening with your students. And one of the things we found in our data is demography is not destiny. What students choose to do is a lot more predictive than their demographic variables. It's student behavior. And if you want to get student behavioral data, the LMS really helps you. And here's the only things you have to do with the LMS. Use the LMS to create a shell for your courses, allow the students to access their curricular resources via the LMS, connect with each other, connect with the faculty member, and check their grades. If, if you do just those five things, and just becomes an infrastructure, you create a data stream that goes into your intelligence system which allows you to understand who's on track and who's off track. Does that make sense? Okay, but it means you gotta be willing to have that uncomfortable conversation about LMS usage with people who don't necessarily wanna use it. And that intelligence system, if you, once you combine, what we have learned is once you combine the student information system data with the LMS data, you suddenly could turn your lights on and understand when students are on track and off track, combined with other kinds of data sources. That's part of creating a student intelligence strategy. And once you do that, you can do things like this. So, um, personalizing the pathways. You can't see this perfectly, but this is a tool called Degree Map. And what Degree Map basically does is for students, it says for any student, no matter where they are in their program, it says a student like you at this stage, here's the next set of courses you probably should take. And it's all based on data on the most successful students. So they always have a recommendation of their next set of courses, okay? <clears throat> What's great about it is it also shows them their minors and their certificates that go underneath it and certifications. We found that we have a whole bunch of students, when we've done this analysis, who were done and didn't know it, okay? Or they achieved certificates and didn't know it because this does a match against all the other things that are there. And then, do students ever wanna change majors? Any students ever wanna change a major, okay? What this tool does is do, it basically does what no advisor can do, which is take the credit accumulation of a student and do a match against every degree at the institution and say, here's how far along you'd be on other degrees. And so you can see your top five degrees, you'd be farthest along, and you can do a click on it and see a side by side. Here's where I am, here's where I'd be. Cost difference, time difference, course difference. Okay? And, the, and by the way, I would say, well, what kind of job does that lead to? You link out to MZ data, and the MZ data shows you local job market, state job market, national job market. Think students like this information? Yeah, the number one thing you get from students is where has this been, right? The idea is they've wanted all that, when you taught, we did a 300-hour ethnography with advisors and students, and what they basically told us was we come into the advising session for three things. One, to figure out where I am. Two, to figure out the next thing I really should do. And then third, to explore some options about other things I might wanna do. And if you can at least scaffold that and help them make better choices, make it hard for them to make a bad choice, good things can happen. Our problem is we have so many students who end up, first of all, not graduating, or they graduate with debt, which is even worse. Anybody know what the student loan debt right now is in the, in the nation? It's $1.6 trillion. It's more than all the credit card debt combined, it's all the mortgage debt combined, and you can't discharge it with bankruptcy. Degree, a, a degree, well if you graduate with debt and no degree, it is the worst possible outcome. So getting a student on a path and keeping them on the path and helping them make the right choices really matter. What we've also learned, by the way, is it's not, by the way, this works. What the data shows, this is anywhere from a 10 to 20 point jump when you get students this kind of information. But we've also learned you have to help them with scheduling. Our schedules are not the most logically core oriented things. Are you with me on this? How are most schedules built in higher education for the course schedules? They're built on three things. Facilities availability, what faculty want to do, and what we did last year, right? Okay. And the students are expected to navigate that to be able to get through an entire pathway. So this tool called Scheduler, what it does is it asks the students what classes do you need to take, then tell me about your life. Here are my constraints. I'm working at this time, I have childcare at this time, I need this much travel time between campuses. It takes their classes and their constraints and does an optimization match against the calendar and comes back and shows them, here are the five calendars that work for you. Why that works is because it's just math. A student who tries to do this on their own always sub-optimizes because the minute they choose one, they limit their choices on the next, which limits their choices on the next. But this is the main thing, is we're we have to help our students navigate. Does that make sense? 
help them navigate. If we help them choose their courses, build their schedules, really good things happen out of it, and then power advisors with data. If you can get data to advisors that say, here are your advisees, and based on our data, and based on, here's what faculty are saying about these students, so you have faculty and advisors connecting with each other. This is a tool called Next Generation Inspire. The faculty and advisors can collaborate, but then the data actually pops up and says, here are the 10 students that if you don't do something about, you're probably gonna lose them in the next two weeks. Right, and here are the big engagement opportunities for you with these students. Think advisors want this information? Yeah, well they're trying to figure out how do I triage this kind of stuff and make this larger work. But then there's even simpler stuff where you can say, this is where precision engagement comes in, which says, um, well, there's also the idea of getting the data to the students. And the, and the idea of personalized mobile devices, trust me, we're gonna have personalized guides mobile devices that go, mobile apps that go right to students and help guide them. Here are the five things you need to do before the semester ends, the three things to do to get ready for the next one. These kinds of things students want and they're really engaging with, but we also need to be willing to do more precision engagement and a little less spray and pray, right? A lot of our programs are deep, kind of like for everybody when we really should be doing more precise things. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples, one example in particular. We did some meta-analysis across our institutions and this is something that blew a lot of people away. A lot of people think the reason students are struggling in higher education, the biggest reason are academics. I gotta make, if you remember nothing from this presentation, please remember this. It is not the only reason they're struggling. In fact, the majority of students aren't, the big reason they're having trouble is not academic. In fact, our meta-analysis across four million students in the last year showed that if you look at the students who left, 98% of institutions lost more students above 2.0 than below 2.0, okay? 78% of the students who left were above 2.0. But listen to this, about 44 to 45% of the students who left were above, were between 3.0 and 4.0. They were high achieving students. Why are they leaving? Why are they leaving? It's life and logistics and psychosocial, right? It's, it's, Job problems, car problems, family problems, whatever it's gonna be, combined with housing insecurity, food insecurity, combined with a whole host of other reasons. But we have to remember that it is not just the academics. Academics matter, but it's gonna be a family of things we have to do outreach for. The folks at Lone Star had this really neat program where what they did was they used the predictive model and they went in and they said, let's identify all the high achieving students who the predictive model says are probably gonna leave. And they basically just wanted to touch base and say, hey, we're here. And they basically did a nudge campaign to be able to reach out to them, to ask them questions. And the basic email said, um, we're proud of you. These kinds of challenges are normal. And if you have any of these kind of challenges, please talk to us and let's have, a, let's have a conversation. And it had almost a 10 to 15 point bump just doing that kind of larger outreach. It really means something to drive out. The folks at the Hope Center, if you haven't spent some time talking, look at the Hope Center. Sarah Goldrick's, Rab, Sarah Goldrick Rab's book, Paying the Price, is one of the most powerful books out there on this topic. Um, and she has this thing called the Hope Center, which is the center that does research on housing insecurity and food insecurity. And one of the things she's found is in our community colleges nationally, one out of 10 students are homeless, 30% are food insecure, and it's really hard to study if you're hungry. You know, students are people first, right? And we gotta figure out who they are and where they are and how we wrap some support services around that. And let me tell you what, people who think, oh, they're just lazy, stop it. There, I mean, there are some people, you do the student focus groups, they're overcoming unbelievable challenges. They've made huge life commitments to come to our colleges, and we gotta figure out how we honor that and how we help them along that pathway if we're gonna drive that kind of process. Here's the email that Lone Star sent that I loved. Um, the emails went out, it, it basically identified high-performing students who were off track, who looked like they were gonna drop out. The email subject line said, we're proud of you. By the way, students said, for this kind of message, don't send me a text, that's creepy. I don't want you in my text world for that. They said, I'm, we're fine with an email, but make sure it's identified as something I would respond to. Make sure it's from somebody I know, not from the student success team, right? It's gotta be from a person that I've met before. And then, the, by the way, the we're proud of you um, subject line has an 85% open rate. I mean, it's at the point where if I want my wife to open my email, I'm like, I'm proud of you, right? And then email comes popping out. But the idea is that no can drive outreach and drive some kind, of, of some kind of information back where suddenly you have that student interacting with the advisor and they can make some kind of conversation around it. This kind of work works. The folks at Lorraine Community College um, really focused in on all three of these. The intelligence platform, the work around um, personalizing the pathways and precision engagement. And let me tell you their story. They were the last worst performing community college in the state of Ohio. 
They were falling off the cliff seven years ago. Marsha Ballinger and her team, about five years ago, really drove into this work. They tried to create, they took 300 majors and brought it down to nine meta majors with clear pathways. They created tools to allow advisors to have better information. They got data to students, and they also did this work of precision engagement. And over the course of the last five years, they've had a 20% increase in retention, 89% more degrees awarded, 60% more graduates. And they will tell you, by the way, they went from last in the state in the performance-based funding to first, okay? And it, by the way, it's just fewer choices, clearer opportunities, better pathway kind of work if they're gonna make it work. Um, great examples from Arizona State University, University of South Florida, and others that have done this larger work. The idea there are models out there you can steal great ideas from, but none of it's gonna work. I'm gonna bring this home now. None of it's gonna work without your leadership. It means we have to have leadership on this road. If we're gonna be able to do transformative work and learning and build these kind of pathways, we need the leadership to be able to make it work. First of all, if you're gonna start messing around with data, you actually have to ask the hard questions about privacy and make sure especially that if you're gonna use data, you do no harm, right? The medical, the medical um, admonition or the medical ethic really matters here. The idea of using data, you have to make sure you're doing no harm because if your orientation towards data is to maximize the outcomes for the institution, you can hurt students. Does that make sense? Because I've seen institutions look at data and say, we're gonna counsel these students who wanna get a STEM degree into a sociology degree because it's gonna be easier for them and that's gonna be a better outcome for us as an institution. Is that something we should do? No, we have to start using the data to think about how we use that data to actually help the student. And here's the biggest shift. It's making the shift out of an accountability mindset into a culture of care. This little, this little matrix is the simplest way to think of it. If you want to drive this kind of leadership, think about two capacities, the capacity to really use information and the capacity to change at your institution. The folks at the Gates Foundation have something called the Frontier Set, which are the leading institutions that are driving change at scale. And they will tell you the institutions that drive change at scale are the ones that have these two capacities in a big way. They have the ability to change and they have the ability to use data. At the low end of insight, insight capacity, is you can only do the reporting you have to do for accreditation or for licensure or for your state reports. High end is the deep predictive flow modeling we've been talking about. Low change is you don't want to change at all, you're only changing because you have to, or high change is you're innovating, you're trying things to help your students best you can. And you probably know people in all four of these quadrants. There are definitely some institutions or in some departments at institutions that are low, low. They only do data work because they have to, right? and they don't really want to change. A friend of mine calls this the, um, he says, we're really data-driven. We are a data-driven organization. I go, knowing them, I'm like, I don't see the same machine. No, no, my president makes a decision. He drives me to find data to back up the decision he's already made, right? Okay, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is moving beyond that and getting out of, by the way, the upper left-hand quadrant is analysis paralysis. You get a bunch of data and you say, oh my God, what do we do about this? and you focus on the cause as opposed to figuring out how you change the trajectory for your students, or you just adopt as best practices. Here's the problem with best practices. They're directional and they're important, but they're not necessarily about you. What's happening at one institution is totally different than another institution. You have to make sure you look at your students and figure out how you're gonna drive the change against your students. And then you have to be willing to see what's working. We've been doing these things called impact studies. We have a tool called impact, which analyzes all the big initiatives. Here's one of the biggest problems. When you get people in this lower right-hand quadrant around best practices, you get a lot of leaders going to conferences who hear the same speech about the five things everybody needs to implement that's gonna fix everything. Have you seen this? Okay. Here's the challenge is I, I can't tell you how many colleges I've been to where they'll tell me we are going through deep, deep initiative fatigue. We can't implement another thing. For the love of God, do not let the president go to another conference, right? <laughs> right? What they want to do is fewer things at a high level, which means you've got to have the leadership ability to analyze what's happening and see what the work is. We've been doing these impact analyses. We've done about 1,000 of them now over the last year and a half, which actually gives you a test to see what the impact of your initiatives. And what we've found in doing over 1,000 of these is about 60% of your student success initiatives are actually creating lift, but about 40% aren't. And let me give you a big early warning about early warning systems. It's one of the ones we've found negative results in. Early warning systems for students can be very helpful, but they also can be damaging. You have to really test the messaging because if the message to students is, hey, we notice you're gone, we want you to get back on track, let's talk about how we do it, that's great. But if your message is, this email is to inform you that you have missed three classes, if you miss one more, you are gone. 
By the way, that came directly from a story from a student, a returning mother with three kids, who got that email, and she had come over the objection of her family. She had a giant incident with her kids where they got the flu, and she had to take care of them and missed work, and then she ended up getting that email. What was her response to that email? Yeah, I thought she'd be angry about it, but she wasn't. She literally said to me, I thought it was a sign from God that I wasn't supposed to be in school. Yeah. And I'm sure the person who wrote that text for that early warning never meant that to be the outcome, but wow, we got to test. We got to see what this, meant. by the way, when you do a meta-analysis of your messaging, I would encourage all of you to do this. I want you to analyze the messages the letters and the notes that are going out to your students from all your different offices at your campus and analyze whether or not you think those are actually helping them stay on track or, or, or are they encouraging or discouraging. What you find when you do this is actually a lot of that messaging is contractual, it's legalistic, it's transactional, it's not motivating, right? It doesn't connect them, encourage them to stay on it. You gotta think about all this stuff as a design strategy for pulling it together. And by the way, we've seen some things that really work. Advising really works, the right kind of advising. Students really want advising. And by the way, advising doesn't always have to be a person, it's advising support, the right kinds of resources from different tools. That club one does not mean we want you to club your students. Please, don't club your students. But what this has to do is clubs. What we've seen is things like Phi Theta Kappa and other kinds of tools, clubs really work. If students get engaged in clubs and activities, really positive outcomes for our students. Service learning, really positive, um, along with different kinds of specific tutoring support. But what we found in particular is you want to be able to optimize and, and tool this. So for example, one of the most important resources is writing support for our students. Not just math, but writing. And one of the things you find when you study writing centers is they always get a lift, but the students who get the biggest lift are the students who really need the writing center. It's sometimes a 10 to 15 point lift. The problem is, is hardly any of the students who really need the writing center are going to the writing center. Okay, have you seen this? And when you, an when you ask them, why aren't you going to the writing center, you know what you find out? Is they feel like going to the writing center is admitting defeat. They feel like somebody's gonna figure out they don't belong there, because a lot of them are suffering from the imposter syndrome. They feel like someone's gonna figure out they don't belong there anyway, and going there is like admitting it. So one of the things they've done is a couple of schools have now done this kind of outreach campaign in the first week of the semester to say, just so you know, our best students go to the writing center. Most of the students who go to the writing centers are getting A's and B's, come join the party. We want you to at least try to go to the writing center once in the first month, right? And the idea is to encourage that. But that's where you get the data and you can tune and test and try this and pull it together. Folks, there is a lot of work to do. And what I want you to walk away from this presentation with is, be careful. We are surrounded by bad news about education all over the place. We're out of money, we're failing, all kinds of things are happening. I gotta tell you, I think we have an amazing road ahead of us. We have more tools at our disposal to learn at a higher level than ever before. Uh, and I, we have got the tools to help students understand their pathway and navigate their pathway like never before. And people are doing amazing work in this area, but you've got to believe it's doable. You have to believe it's doable. And you have to be able to filter out the naysayers who are kind of slamming education and understand that the only time anything like this has ever been built is by people who've been willing to put their work into it. It takes intent, it's like what they, Pinker says, it doesn't just happen. It takes focused and intentional effort to make this happen. You've got to be willing to lean in and ask the hard questions questions. And sometimes, by the way, when you do this work, you're going to get data back that doesn't look so great. And I mean, one of the biggest things I hope you take away from this is you as leaders have to be able to look at your institution. You have to inspire a culture of wonder as opposed to a culture of blame. Because when data comes up that looks bad, our first reaction in higher education is often to say, whose fault is that? We want to slam. You have to stop that. You gotta to move to a culture of wonder which says, how do we design something better? How do we design something at a higher level? I, was, um, I shared the story yesterday with the senior administration group. I was doing, a, I do a lot of convocation speeches at colleges to kick off semesters. Um, and I was at Scottsdale Community College in Arizona in August. Um, I have two degrees from Arizona State University so I know what it's like in August in Arizona. For those of you who don't, it's really hot, okay? It's like 115, 120 degrees. And they get these things in the afternoon in August called monsoons. And the monsoons are just as dry as heck until three o'clock and then suddenly it gets super wet like a monsoon and giant dust storms come in and a huge storm attacks. Um, anyway, I landed, got into downtown Tempe, and, I, and I, when I, tra I travel all the time, so I love to do urban hikes. Um, I got out to go do a walk, and I was gonna go get some food at a, a pizza place down there called Oregano, take my pizza back to the hotel um, on about a mile and a half walk. So I'm walking out, I've, I've been out for about 10 minutes, and my phone begins to explode. Every alert and alarm in the world happens on my phone, and that's literally the alarms that were coming up on my phone. 
And I'm walking west, and I, I'm looking at this, and I'm like, what's going on? And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm in Arizona. And I literally turn around, and as I look east, there's a giant wall of black dust coming from the east. Okay, and that's one of these monsoons. And I immediately start looking and thinking, okay, I've got, I'm doing the math in my head. Okay, I've got at least 20 minutes to get to the restaurant. I get the food, come back. I'm going to be in the middle of the storm by the time I get back. I can't do this. I go, so I'm going to walk back to the hotel, get in my car, and drive to the restaurant and get my food. At least I'll be in my car when the storm is hitting. So I'm, I made a good choice. Turned back around, got, going back to the hotel. And for those of you who know the area, I go down um, University Boulevard, up, up, up Mill. I get into the, to, I'm at um, Tempe Mission Palms. I go into the hotel area. And there's a guy at the bell stand talking to a couple that's about to go walk into downtown Tempe. And he's trying to dissuade them from going to walk into downtown Tempe because of the giant storm that's coming. And the guy's like, ah, oh, we're from Florida. We know storms. Don't worry about it. And the bell guy looks at me, and I look at him. We're like, oh, my gosh. And they take off. And we're like, OK. So I get to my car. And I drive out to my restaurant. And as I'm driving to the restaurant, the wind is picking up. Start, things are starting to fly sideways. Giant rainstorm starts coming down. Big, thick rain. Giant clouds of dust around me. I get to the, to the uh, restaurant, get out. People are just running off the patio. They're closing things down. I get into the restaurant, get my food. As I'm walking from the front door of the restaurant to my car, I get pelted. I'm like covered, just totally soaked. I get into my car with, my, with the pizza. I close it down and turn on the windshield wipers. Things are going in all directions. I'm like, get back to the hotel. So I get on the road get back, start getting back to the hotel. Again, these storms are really weird because it's heavy dust, all kinds of rain, tumbleweed flying in all directions. Um, I get onto Mill Avenue to get back to the hotel, and as I'm driving up Mill Avenue, I see the couple. And in a scene I have not seen since Gilligan's Island reruns, <laughs> the guy is holding onto a palm tree as he's being blown sideways, and the wife is holding onto the guy as she's being blown sideways. And they're on the other side of the street, and I'm like, okay, i got to turn around and help these guys, so I'm going to turn around. And as I'm about to turn around, he lets go, and they start flailing backwards, and then they run into a vape shop. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure they weren't going to a vape shop. <laughs> but I know they're safe, so I'm okay. So I, I go ahead and go back to my hotel, and I just thought to myself, and in fact, I wrote a blog about this, and this will link you out to it. Um, <clears throat> but what a wonderful metaphor this is. Um, back in the 1950s, a couple of grad students uh, disobeyed their advisor. Um, they, were, they were working on a grant. They disobeyed their advisor, and they stayed in a radar center. Um, they were studying radar patterns of weather um, over the objection of their advisor. And because they stayed in there, they discovered something called the hook echo pattern. And the hook echo pattern was a signal that showed you the formation of tornadoes, and, and eventually it showed you the formation of, of hurricanes. And that research led to a whole series of early warning systems that since the 1950s have created large systems like the Doppler radar system, all the way down to the apps that blew up on my phone on that day. Think about it. Innovation from a small group of people um, that said, we want to do something that will create signal that will help us save lives. They, told, they, they now estimate that that research has rippled out and created this infrastructure for weather warning systems around the world. And sometimes the weather warning is only 14 minutes, but that 14 minutes is enough to absolutely save lives. That that system alone saves well over a million lives a year. Think about the effort and energy put in to kind of create that signal to say what's going on. Folks, let's be blunt about this. We have 18 million students starting higher education in any given year. You have hundreds of thousands of students in your system. The storms are coming. We know the challenges for these students are coming. The question is, are we going to do the work to create the signal processing to understand how we can help each other and help them navigate those storms and get themselves across the stage and actually do something powerful? It means we're going to have to come together and figure out how we drive this kind of larger conversation. Um, if you go back to the slide for a second, if you want to continue this conversation, I'm going to encourage you, um, feel free to reach out. I'm on Twitter at Mark Milliron. Um, MarkMilliron.com has lots of other resources around this. But I want you to continue to catalyze these conversations and be willing to push back against the negativity that says, and listen to me, you have to be willing to say that these students can be successful. I have been in the sessions where people have been, um, it's somewhere in their heart of hearts, they think that these students can't be successful. I'm telling you. Our students can be successful. They need the right support. They need the right guides. They need the right resources. But you got to believe it in your gut. And you got to have these conversations to figure out how you make them successful. 
All students can learn under the right conditions. You just have to be willing to develop the systems around this. It means we have to be willing to think about the intelligence system, the pathways, and the structure, and we want to help them learn at a high level. I feel like, mark my words on this, I feel like we're entering a golden age of learning where I think we can help more students learn at a high level than ever before and absolutely transform our communities, our states, and our nation, but it means it's going to take leaders to be willing to look at the information and drive this conversation, and it's worth every bit of your effort. Thanks, guys. Because my job is actually IE and IR, Institutional Effectiveness Research, I just want to say that Dr. Milliron's um, percentage of 58% taking a photo of a slide was correct based on that last slide. So <laughs> he, his data is proven. So um, Mark, we appreciate you being here. And on, a, on behalf of the ACCA Executive Committee, we're just presenting you a gift. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's amazing to me, like, when you meet people as successful as he is, you know, a first-generation college student. And how many, if you will, if, if you were a first-generation college student, will you stand up? If you're a product of the Alabama Community College System, would you stand up? That's amazing. It changes our lives. I am, I am one of those. So uh, we're going to take about a 20-minute break. Uh, our, the college presidents told us to take names if you were to leave. So um, we will do that. We have those stationed out there. Um, so you have 20 minutes. Grab a quick drink. Use the restroom. Bring it back in here. And uh, the chancellor will begin at 10, 10 a.m. Thank you. <laughs>